Today, I'm going to talk to you about AI and humanity. I'm going to talk to you about the future. We're going to talk about what will happen to the world after the current AI wave reaches its peak. We're going to talk about what humans can do to make sure that AI is the greatest force for good that humanity has ever seen. And we're going to talk about what we can do to prevent the worst case scenarios and keep ourselves safe. Uh, for the past year or so, uh, as part of this book that Michael mentioned, I've been investigating the ways that AI and automation are reshaping the world. I've read books, done interviews, and gone to a ton of conferences where some tech executive or economist or researcher gets up and talks about all the amazing things that AI and machine learning can do, curing diseases, solving the climate crisis, piloting self-driving cars. They talk about the fourth industrial revolution, and then at the end of sort of three quarters of the way through the talk, they always put up what I call the oh shit slide. Um, this is the slide that has all the scary predictions about what automation could do to jobs, how it could destroy millions of people's livelihoods, make us all obsolete, and oh, by the way, there's probably nothing we can do about it. And then everyone claps and goes to lunch and kind of forgets that we talked about that. But not today. Today, we're going to talk about solutions. We're going to learn how to be future-proof. And just a disclaimer, as Michael said, this book is not technically done yet. Um, I turned it in on Friday, the first draft. So bear with us. Uh, you guys are the beta testers. Um, file your bug reports to Michael or me. And for today, the illustrations for the book haven't come in yet. So for today, you guys get to see my best Microsoft Paint clip art skills. So here we go. For a long time, I had, that's a mountain, by the way. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm available for contracting for design. Um, for a long time, I had a mental model of how technology changed the world. And I called it the machine mountain theory. And the way that the machine mountain theory works is that there's this giant machine, and it's surrounded by water. And the water represents technology. And it gradually rises on the mountain as the machines in our society get more capable. So for millennia, at the beginning of human history, there were no machines. Like, we didn't have anything to worry about. And we all lived down there, like, hunting and gathering happily, trying to avoid being eaten. And then at some point, the water started to rise. We developed tools like agriculture. Uh, and we became ranchers and farmers, and we moved ourselves higher on the mountain. That's us going up the mountain. <laughs> and then the technology changed again, and we became artisans and tradesmen. Then came the, industri uh, the Industrial Revolution, when those jobs became obsolete, and we became factory workers. Then, after machines took over the factory work, we turn into knowledge and service workers, programmers, life coaches, Instagram influencers. That's where we are today. In this model, the, the humans are always one step ahead of the robots. And eventually, once the robots learn how to do the, the work we're currently doing, we'll move up to the top of the mountain, and we'll do something. We'll you know, the machines will be doing all our mundane, unpleasant work, and we will be able to spend our days making art and contemplating philosophy and taking Peloton classes. Like, it's going to be great. <laughs> and that's, that's us partying on top of Machine Mountain. <laughs> and in this model, if we're worried about becoming obsolete or the machines taking our jobs, all we have to do is figure out, like, what the jobs at the top of the mountain are. Like, what are the robot-proof jobs? And then we get to party which is a great model, except it's totally wrong. <laughs> the first problem with the machine mountain theory of history is that there are no robot-proof jobs. That's a robot laughing at you because you think there are robot-proof jobs. And the way we know there are no robot-proof jobs is that for centuries, we've been predicting jobs that machines can't do, and machines have been proving us wrong. So, for example, in 1895, a well-known British physicist, Lord Kelvin, shot down the idea that humans would ever travel through the air, saying that heavier-than-air flying machines were impossible. Eight years later, the Wright brothers flew the first plane at Kitty Hawk. In 1962, an Israeli foreign language expert dismissed the idea that computers could be taught to translate foreign languages. This one took a little longer, but as of last year, Google Translate was processing 143 billion words a day 
with incredible accuracy. In 1997, an astrophysicist told a reporter that playing the board game Go at a championship level was a near impossible task for computers, and that it might take 100 years or more for computers to be able to do that. In March 2016, less than 20 years after that prediction, an AI developed by Google beat the reigning human Go champion in a five-game series. So we're pretty bad at predicting predicting what machines are capable of. And today, we're finding out that machines can do some pretty extraordinary things. So AI is making pretty big strides in finance. It's beating lawyers at issue spotting. It's beating doctors at tumor diagnosis. It's even beating psychologists at relieving symptoms of depression and anxiety in patients in randomly controlled trials. AI is writing music. And it's even writing other AI better than some of its own creators. And believe it or not, I know this is going to be very hard for you guys to believe, but AI can even do the job I'm doing right now. In fact, it already has. The introduction to my speech today was created by an AI called GPT-2, which was developed by OpenAI to generate the introduction to text. So I plugged in the first line, and the AI wrote the rest. I promise this is me now, uh, <laughs> by the way. Unless we're in a simulation and then all bets are off. The point I'm trying to make is that trying to guess which jobs we do today the robots will take away from us next is a losing proposition. It may be that, as Google's AI lead has said, what we can do, machines can do. So what now? Like, there are no robot-proof jobs. What the heck are we supposed to do? So I've spent the last year researching this question. Uh, those are about a fourth of the books that I read. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with those things, they're, they're like tweets, but longer, if you can remember that, that far. Um, and it, it turns out that history is pretty instructive here. Because if you look back at the last couple centuries of technological change, you find some patterns. So history tells us that machines don't kill jobs all at once. And the proof of that is that a lot of those old, low-on-the-mountain jobs still exist. We still have farmers. We still have metal workers. We still have artisanal soap makers. In fact, if you go to Temescal in Oakland, where I live, there's this little alleyway of hipster shops. And it's sort of like a 17th century Renaissance fair in there. Like, they've got people making candles and cobbling shoes. They've, I think they've got a blacksmith somewhere in there. And in fact, according to the Harvard economist James Besson, of the 270 occupations listed in the 1950 census, only one job has actually fully disappeared due to automation. Can anyone guess? If you say newspaper journalist, I'm going to be very offended. There are still a couple of us left. No, it's the elevator operator. They're totally gone. Everyone else is still there. Second, every technological revolution has survivors. During the Industrial Revolution, a lot of artisans and farmers went to work in the big urban factories, but a lot of others kept their jobs. During the first wave of automation in factories in the 20th century, a bunch of manufacturing workers lost their jobs, but a bunch didn't. If you go to a factory now, there are still people there. And I started looking for patterns among these survivors, and I found that the thing that they had in common was that they were strong where the machines of their time were weak. So the question for us in 2019, looking out of the future, is what can we do today that machines can't? So luckily, my job affords me access to a bunch of people who are much smarter than I am. So I asked a bunch of people I know who work on AI and machine learning technology, like what can humans today do well that machines can't? And the first thing I learned is that in general, Machines are really good at doing structured work, work in stable environments with well-defined rules and consistent inputs. But humans, on the other hand, are really good at doing surprising work, work that involves messy data or irregular scenarios, lots of unpredictability. This explains why an AI can beat a human grandmaster in chess, but if you, taught one, if you told one to be a kindergarten teacher for a day, it would do a horrible job. The second thing is that machines are really good at doing what I call servile work, work in which we want something done for us, ideally as accurately and efficiently as possible. 
Humans, on the other hand, are much better at social work, work that taps into emotional desires like belonging and affirmation and status. And in social work, th the economic value is not attached to the thing itself, it's attached to the experience of the thing. So this, for example, is like why we still go to concerts, despite the fact that we all have streaming music services at home. We're not just paying for the music, we're paying for the experience of being in the venue with other people listening to the music. The third thing machines are really good at is scaled work. So if you're making a million of something or looking for patterns in 500,000 data points, that's probably a job for a machine. Humans, on the other hand, are good at what I call scarce work. And I, I don't mean by scarce that there are only a few of these jobs to go around. I mean that they involve sort of rare scenarios or unusual combinations of talents, um, high stakes situations, things like that. These are the jobs that you might only need once in a while, but when you need them, you really need humans to be doing them. So if you call 911, you want a human to answer the phone, not an automated answering service. If you're getting married and you want your wedding to go off smoothly, you hire an experienced wedding planner. You don't trust it to a task rabbit. And if an Airbnb guest trashes your house, like you don't want to fill out a form on a web portal. You want to complain to a person. So to recap, Machines are really good at doing things that are structured, serviled, and scaled. It's nice of them to all start with S for me. Um, and human jobs are, are surprising, social, and scarce. Those are the places where we have the biggest advantages right now. So and our basic strategy for staying relevant in the, AI, the age of AI and automation is to do things that are surprising, social, and scarce. Now, this might sound obvious, but it's very different than how we usually talk about machines and AI and robot replacement. Typically, when we talk about people losing their jobs to automation, it's in the context of you know, someone like Andrew Yang saying, like, truckers are all going to be obsolete, or you know, supermarket cashiers are going to get replaced by the self-service kiosks. And there's even a, a website called uh, willrobotstakemyjob.com, where you can plug in your job title, and it will tell you your risk of being automated. Uh, reporters and correspondents got 11% chance of being automated, which I think is honestly a little generous to us. Uh, I think robots could probably do about 20, 30, 70% of my job. Uh, and like, I don't think everything about this model is, is wrong in the aggregate, but what all the research shows is that while automation sometimes wipes out an entire industry all at once, it's pretty rare. And in fact, like, looking at it this way through the lens of job titles can be pretty misleading. So let's take a quiz. I'm going to tell you two jobs, and you tell me which one of them is easier to automate, coffee maker or fashion designer. Now, the obvious answer here is coffee maker. We literally have machines in our houses called coffee makers. We've had them for 50 years. And yet, every city in America is filled with humans who make coffee for a living. Why? because it turns out that they're providing more than just coffee. Their job looks like a servile job, but it's actually a social job. Fashion designers, on the other hand, seems like a job that would be very hard to automate. It's you know, creative, it requires a specialized training and education. But it turns out that a lot of fashion design is really pattern recognition and coming up with variations on a theme, which AI is very good at. In fact, these clothes on these models were produced by a neural network uh, program called Deep Vogue, which won a prize at a Chinese fashion show earlier this year. So when it comes to AI and machine learning and jobs, your job title is not your destiny. What you do matters less than how you do it. A great example of this in my own life is this guy. This is my friend Russ. Um, Russ does my taxes. He's my tax preparer. And uh, as you can see from the photo, he's not your typical H&R Block CPA. <laughs> um, Russ used to be a stand-up comedian. And a few years ago, he started a firm that helps artists, comedians, actors, other freelancers with their taxes. I know you probably don't associate doing your taxes with comedy, but I can assure you that Russ is very, very funny. Uh, I have more fun in our annual you know, April 14th tax consultations <laughs> um, than I have going to actual comedy shows that I pay money for. 
And that's not an accident. Russ trains all of his employees in improv comedy because he thinks that the skills that you need for improv are the same skills that you need to help people with their taxes. He's trying to turn taxes from a horrible chore into an entertaining human experience. And he wants every client to come away feeling like they've gotten something more than a refund. I asked Russ once why he did this, like why train your workers in improv comedy? That seems totally unrelated. And what he told me was that it was sort of an anti-automation strategy. He said, quote, a lot of tax preparers want you to drop off your papers, go away, and send them a check for $400. That's ideal market efficiency, and that's why TurboTax killed them. Our defining value, he said, is the conversation we have with you. Now, technically, I should be worried about Russ. I should be very worried about Russ, because if you look at all the studies of automation and jobs, tax preparation is literally the, most, the single most automatable human job. It's tied with telemarketing in an Oxford study as having a 99% chance of being automated. And if Russ were just some CPA cranking out tax returns at a strip mall somewhere, I would probably tell him to find another line of work. But I'm not worried about Russ, because he's figured out a way to make his work very surprising, very social, and very scarce. And as a result, he's probably not going anywhere. So with all this in mind, what would a better model of automation risk look like? You're about to get some more of my cutting edge graphic design. You ready? Um, so this is, <laughs> this is Humanity Hill. You can clap later for the graphic design. Uh, Humanity Hill works the exact same way as Machine Mountain with one big difference. Now, instead of your position on the hill being determined by what job you have, it's determined by how you do that job. So, we see that the structured, servile, and scaled jobs are down here at the bottom, and the surprising, social, and scarce jobs are up here at the top, where it's safer. And you might be surprised who ends up where on this chart. If you're a CEO, but you spend all your time having routine meetings, you know, like forecasting routine sales, providing the same services to your clients, if you're letting your Gmail app like type your emails for you, um, you might be closer to the bottom than the top. And if you're a retail worker, and you're excellent at handling surprises, making people feel really special, and selling a thing that you're uniquely qualified to sell, you might be closer to the top. And when the water rises, as it always does, it won't necessarily be the most educated people or the ones with the fanciest degrees who are safe. It will be the ones who are the best at being humans. So taking comedy classes is one way to get to be more human, make your work more human. But there are other ways. In my book, I'll have nine of them. Uh, oh, that's us partying on top of the hill. We're all safe again. Um, I'll, today, I'll just run through three. Uh, the first one is to get off your phone. Um, this is a surprising one. Um, and I confess that I am a recovering phone addict. Um, for years, I spent six, seven, eight hours a day on my phone. But earlier this year, I did a 30-day phone detox. I went to rehab. Uh, I had a professional phone coach take me through a program. I put a rubber band around my phone. Uh, this is my sobriety chip. Um, to remind myself to be mindful whenever I pulled it out. And I deleted my social media apps, and I started retraining my brain to focus, to be still, to not always seek stimulation. And there are all kinds of good health reasons to avoid doing this, and it, you're also kind of a jerk if you're on your phone all the time. But the reason it ties into AI and automation is because research shows that excessive smartphone use is correlated with a loss in emotional intelligence and actually makes us worse at the kinds of tasks that separate us from machines. So there's, there's this great study in the book I talk about where these researchers took two groups of kids. Um, they, they gave them both a series of uh, emotional intelligence tests. And then they sent half the kids on a five-day camping trip without their phones. And the other half stayed in school with their phones. And then after the trip, they all came back and they readministered the tests. And they found that, you know, obviously the group that stayed home with their phones was essentially flat on the tests. But the group that went on the camping trip, their scores increased dramatically. Just five days without their phones had made them better at understanding and relating to other people. 
The second piece of advice is to work in an office. Now, this one is also controversial because a lot of tech experts who are in Silicon Valley will say that the office is totally obsolete. In the future, we'll have all kinds of, you know, we'll just plug into our meetings via VR or telepresence robots. Uh, you know, what's an office anyway? Um, but I think this is wrong, and I, I think that the office is going to become more important rather than less important as our jobs become more human. Because research also tells us that while workers are often more productive at home because they don't have all the distractions, they're less creative. They're more creative when they're around other people. Offices put us in situations where we have to collaborate with our coworkers, where we can socialize after work. We can make these random interactions, you know, at the dining hall or, the, or in the hallway. Uh, John Sullivan, a management professor in San Francisco, calls these serendipitous interactions. And Steve Jobs and other tech leaders have famously believed in serendipitous interactions. It's why, despite the fact that the tech companies in Silicon Valley make all the tools that allow for remote work, they all still have these huge corporate campuses right here in Silicon Valley, and they make all their employees come to them. And I think in a time of increasing automation, the value of this face-to-face -face communication is going to rise. And the office is going to play a role in creating those connections. There's that old business saying, you can't fax a handshake. Right? I think now it would be like you can't zoom a handshake or something. But the basic principle is the same. The third tip, and this is for the bosses in the room, uh, is to use AI to empower people, not control them. So today, in industries from fast food to uh, call centers to fancy law firms, uh, AI tools are being marketed and sold that allow managers to have greater visibility into their employees' lives, to maximize their productivity, to standardize their output. And I just want to warn you to be very careful with these tools. Tread carefully and, and, and just be thoughtful about them. Because we have about 200 years worth of industrial history about what happens when new technology is used to control workers. And it's not good. Workers don't like being micromanaged by human bosses, but they really hate being micromanaged by machine bosses. And when workers feel, who used to feel like they had, they had agency and control and creativity over their jobs feel like they get turned into button pushers and rule followers, it causes trouble. So in the 1970s, we even had a name for this. It was called Lordstown Syndrome. And the reason it was called Lordstown Syndrome is because in 1972, a group of auto workers at a GM plant in Lordstown, Ohio, went on a 22-day strike. And the thing they were striking about was not pay, it was not benefits, it was not time off. It was about the machinery that had recently been installed in the factory. This was going to be GM's most cutting edge automated factory. And this machinery did make some productivity improvements, but it also increased the pace of work. It measured and tracked the workers on an individual level, and it sort of squeezed every drop of productivity out of them. The syndrome spread beyond the auto industry, and it became known as this nationwide phenomenon called the blue-collar blues. Um, all over the country, as, as machines came into industry, they took away workers' agency and their freedom, and the workers rebelled. And it didn't matter in the end that the machines were more efficient than the old way of doing things, because there were no humans around to operate them. So today, it's tempting to extend this and, and just sort of use AI as a kind of shadow boss. At IBM, machine learning is now used in performance evaluations. So in addition to telling you how you did last year, um, the machine tells you how you're going to do next year. At Amazon, software now can automatically generate the paperwork to fire an employee if they miss their productivity targets. And at call centers, AI is now being used to score workers based on the detected levels of empathy in their voice. So I want to make it clear, like, despite all this dystopian futurism, I'm not a Luddite. I love technology. I write about technology for a living. And I think AI can be an amazing tool. It can unlock creativity. It can free us from horrible work. And it can make our daily lives easier and more convenient. But it can also be used to surveil people, to introduce bias and errors, and to strip away creativity. And if you're doing this in your own companies or your own organizations, I urge you to make sure you're, you're doing it in ways that preserve and, aug and augment humanity rather than taking it away. Uh, there's an episode of Star Trek that I love. Uh, it's called The Ultimate Computer. It's from season two. And the plot is that the USS Enterprise gets this new automated control system installed in it. And at first, it works great. Everyone's happy, runs the whole ship. 
But then it starts malfunctioning. It attacks other starships. It makes these like weird, inexplicable decisions to shut itself down. And at the end of the episode, Mr. Spock, who's you know, famously the, the logical one, he disconnects the system. And he says to Captain Kirk, computers make excellent and efficient servants, but I have no wish to serve under them. I like that. Um, let me leave you today with a challenge. Uh, rather than being freaked out by AI and automation or thinking it's someone else's problem or there's nothing else we can do, think about how human you feel in the course of your daily work. Think about the last time you did something truly surprising and consider how many of your choices today were actually made by machines. So did you let a machine tell you how to get here today? or what playlist to listen to in the car? Did an algorithm choose what news you read or what emails you sent? And challenge yourself for the next few days to reclaim those choices for yourself, to surprise yourself and the people around you, and to bring all of your humanity to bear on your work and your life outside of work. Be as human as possible and build the kind of organizations that allow other people to be human too. We can avoid being replaced by machines, but first we need to build an economy and a work culture that rewards humanity. And then, and only then, we can become our best, most irreplaceable selves. Thank you.